there was this Scottish lawyer. He was a very, very wicked man. And once he hired a horse that he needed to do uh, some work with, and either through an accident or through ill usage, he ended up killing the animal. And naturally, the owner wasn't too happy about that, and he insisted that this lawyer pay him its value together with some compensation for the loss of its use. And this man of law acknowledged his liability. He said he was perfectly fine and willing to pay. But at that moment, he was a little straight for ready cash. So he asked the owner of that horse, would it be okay if I can give you a promissory note? Certainly, the owner said. Whereupon the lawyer further said, well, on this promissory note, I need, I need a long date in order for me to be able to pay you fully what you need. And the creditor said, well, you can fix your own time. You can put your own time on that promissory note. And so the wicked man then drew the note, making it payable at the day of judgment. So on this promissory note, he put that he would pay on the day of judgment. Well, obviously, this lawyer hadn't paid for a while, and so the creditor ended up taking him to court. And there in defense, the lawyer asked the judge to look at the note. And the judge did so, and the judge replied with this response. He said, the promissory note is perfectly good, sir, and as this is the day of judgment, I decree that you pay tomorrow. We're going to be looking at the book of 2 Peter this morning. In fact, it will be 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. But before I read those verses, what I want us to understand is that in the letter of 2 Peter, one of the primary concerns was on false teachers. In fact, Peter was concerned that false teachers had come into the church and had spread the teaching that Jesus was not going to return. And of course, once you believe that Jesus Christ is not going to return, you decide that, well, that means I can do whatever I want. So I can just, just do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about Jesus coming back. A, few, a lot of years have passed between when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven up until this letter was written. And so these false teachers were saying, well, since he hadn't returned yet, then he's probably not going to return at all. But Peter writes this second letter in order to refute that teaching. And here is what 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 say. It says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word here this morning. And Heavenly Father, I just pray through the Holy Spirit that you would help me to preach your word as it is, with as much passion as I can, and I pray that you would help my words be your words. And I pray that those that are listening to this sermon, I pray that they would not only receive this message in their hearts, but I pray they would also apply this message to their lives as well. And I especially pray for those who may be listening that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I just pray, Lord, that through this message, that they would put their faith and trust in him. And I pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So what we're going to talk about here this morning in this passage is that Peter is going to be explaining about how time works with God. Of course, when we think about God's timing and our timing, there's times where we think that God is not on time on things, or that God is not worried about fulfilling certain things. We think that God should follow our time instead of his own time. 
But what we're going to see here is that God operates on his own timing. So we're going to talk about three things this morning that this passage talks about. First, we're going to see that God creates time. We're going to see that God is on time. And we're going to see that God gives time. So God creates time. God is on time. And God gives time. So first, we're going to see that God creates time. That God creates time. As verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 3 says, it says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. God is the creator of time. If we look back in the book of Genesis, we see that God did certain things on the first day. He did certain things on the second day, and the third day, and on through six days. So we see even there in the creation that God had set apart days of the week. And it's my belief and my study of Scripture that these were pretty much around 24-hour days that we, that we know of today. Now, I know some others may believe uh, and, and some other beliefs concerning that, but I'm just sharing with you what my personal belief is on that Scripture. But we see that since God is the creator of time, it means this, is that God is not bound by time. And God looks at time a lot differently than we do. In fact, Peter draws from Psalm 90, verse 4, when he's talking about this verse. And Psalm 90, verse 4 says this, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. So what he's saying here is this, What could be a long time for us? which may be days, weeks, or even years, may only just be one day to the Lord. In other words, God operates on a different time schedule than we do because, again, he is the creator of time. And what we need to understand as well is that everything happens on God's timing and not on our time. It's, let's just be honest. God is so powerful, he can see what's ahead of us. And he knows when is the best time to bless us. And he also knows the best time when to protect us from certain things. I, I know one thing that I often complain about is when I'm going down the road, I end up getting stuck behind someone that's going very, very slow. Especially if it's a single lane highway where you just have one lane going in one direction and another lane going uh, in the other direction. And I get complained, I get stuck behind somebody that's going way below the speed limit. But how do I know that God may intentionally be doing that, maybe possibly to protect me from getting involved in an accident? It could very well be a possibility. So even what we perceive as inconveniences could be God's way of protecting us from something that could definitely change our lives forever. So everything happens according to God's time and not our time. We also see this in another scripture that you may be familiar with. It's from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. And here's what those verses said. It says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. You see, there's always time 
for everything. And God is the one who determines when those times come. Even with our seasons, God is the one who determines the weather. He's the one who determines our seasons. He's the one who determines whether we get sunshine or that we get rain. But it's also times where he determines one day we may be in prosperity, but in other times it may be in adversity. But regardless of what goes on, everything operates on God's time. So we see that God is the creator of time. Second, we see that God is on time. We see that God is on time. 2 Peter 3, 9a says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. So we see, the, if we were to look at this in the Greek word, the Greek word for slow actually means late. So what Peter is saying here is that the Lord is not late in fulfilling his promises. He always fulfills his promises on time. Now, since God created time, God also knows the perfect time to fulfill his promise. Now, of course, the promise that he's referring to here in this verse is, of course, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We may think as humans that God is taking a long time to fulfill this promise. And, yeah, it's been about 2,000 years since we've seen Jesus Christ ascend up into heaven. And I agree, that is a long time. But we have to understand that God knows the perfect time to fulfill it. We also have to remember this as well. I'm sure many of you may be familiar with those who try to set a specific date on when Jesus Christ will return. I've, I've seen it a couple of times, and I'm probably those of you that are older than me, you've probably seen it many times. You've had certain people who try to uh, look through the Bible, try to do all these mathematical formulas and everything that they claim is biblical, and they try to set a specific date on when Jesus Christ will return. And they reveal this date, and then they and their followers try to prepare as much as they can for that date. But here's the thing, with all, with all those that have tried to predict a date, every single one of them have been wrong. And here's the reason why. Because there is nowhere in Scripture where it says a specific date of Jesus Christ returning. Now, the Scripture is very clear that one day Jesus Christ will return. But you don't see the Apostle Peter in any of his letters give a specific date. You don't see the Apostle John in his letters give a specific date. You don't see Matthew, Mark, or Luke give a specific date. You don't see the Apostle Paul giving a specific date in any of his letters in the New Testament. In fact, you can look throughout the whole Bible and you will not find a specific date on when Jesus Christ will return. But the Bible is clear that one day Jesus Christ will return to this earth to establish his millennial kingdom. But we have to remember, again, he's going to fulfill that promise on his own time, not on our own timeline. But what we have to remember is that Jesus Christ fulfills every promise that he makes. If you were to look through the whole Bible, all the promises that Jesus Christ makes and that, the, and that God the Father makes, every single one of them, they have come through on. And if they have come through with all of those promises, then I can guarantee you that he will fulfill the promise of returning. I don't know when that day will come. It could be later on today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week, next year, or it could still be another thousand, two thousand years from now. We just don't know. But I can tell you that one day Jesus Christ will return. In fact, there's other scriptures that confirm that God fulfills his promises. For example, Galatians 4.4 4 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, 
God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. It was thousands of years from the time that the fall in Genesis happened until Jesus Christ was born there in Bethlehem. But again, God fulfilled his promise. And when that time came for God to fulfill his promise, he was right there to fulfill it. Hebrews 10, 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised, which means Jesus, he who promised is faithful. And of course, if you were to keep reading, you talk about in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of one another, or gathering together as the church, because it says that the day of the Lord is approaching. Again, that's referring to, the judgment day. Hebrews 10 37, a few verses later. Again, it says, Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. So, again, the promise is made here is that one day Jesus Christ will come and it will not be delayed. God the Father knows when Jesus Christ will be returning here on this earth. And when that time comes, God will fulfill that time. Even Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the angels of heaven didn't know when he would return. Not even Jesus Christ then knew when he was going to return. Now probably now he knows since he's up in heaven with God the Father. But in that particular verse he says that only God the Father knew. And again, if God the Father has fulfilled all the other promises that we see in, the, in Scripture then I promise you he will fulfill that as well. Habakkuk 2, verse 3, it says, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. If there's one thing our society needs more of today, and I'm speaking just of myself as anybody else, it's called the word patience. Jesus Christ may not return on our own timetable, but there will come a day where he will return, and it will be the perfect time. And I promise you he will come at a time when everyone would have had the opportunity to either accept the gift of salvation from him or decide to reject that gift. So God will always be on time. And I promise you that God is never late. He is always on time. Which now leads me to the final point. So we've seen that God creates time. We see that God is on time. And then finally we see that God gives us time. We see that God gives us time. Verse 9b says, But is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Have we ever thought about maybe the reason why Jesus Christ has not returned yet is because he is giving us time for us to either accept that gift of salvation or to reject it. In other words, he is showing us grace. Now, of course, yeah, Jesus could very well have said, you know what, I'm not going to give you any time at all. I'm just going to show up, and then whatever happens, happens. But that's not the way Jesus works. He wants to make sure that we have the opportunity to either accept that gift of salvation or to reject it. <clears throat> but Peter is saying here is that the reason why the second coming of Jesus Christ has not occurred yet, it is not because God is not powerful enough to do it. Because God is certainly power, powerful enough to do it. It is not because God is late. Because we've already established that God is not late in keeping his promises. And it's also not because he wants to judge more people and send them to hell. It's not because of that either. The reason why for the delay is because God is, number one, patient with us. And number two, he is showing us the grace that we don't deserve. He's giving us time to decide whether or not 
we put our faith and trust in him. Several passages of scripture actually illustrate this patience. For example, just a few verses later, 2 Peter 3.15, it says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. So we see that Peter's actually connecting his patience with salvation. God is being patient with us, so he gives us the opportunity to decide, are we going to accept that gift of salvation from Jesus Christ, or are we going to deny and reject that gift that he has offered to us? We also see the prophet Joel in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. You often hear arguments from people. They say, well, when you look in the Old Testament, all you see is God wiping all these people out. Well, there's a reason why. It's because he's given them opportunity to accept him as their God, but instead they chose to worship other gods. And after a while, that time is up. And they had made their decision. And so they had to suffer the consequences of that decision, which is they lost their life. But that's not what God wants to do to anybody. He gives us the choice on whether or not to accept that gift. Because our God is gracious. Our God is merciful. He is slow to anger. And he's abounding in his steadfast love. He loves each and every one of us. And he does not want to proclaim disaster on anybody. He does not want to see anybody lose their life. But he's also not going to force us to choose him either. Luke chapter 15, verse 20. I'm sure you're probably familiar with this chapter. It talks about the prodigal son. In verse 20, this is where the son is returning. If you are not familiar with the story, just to give you highlights of the story, there's this son who wanted his inheritance because he just wanted to get away and be on his own. And so he asks his father for his inheritance. He receives it. And so he goes on, goes to another town. He basically blows his inheritance and he's left with nothing. And he ends up having to feed pigs. And when he's noticing what the pigs are eating, he goes, you know what, even these pigs are better off than I am right now. And so the son made the hard decision to go back to his father. And he was going to tell his father that I'm your slave. Do whatever to me that you wish. But when this son came, we see here in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. This father was just happy to see his son come back. Despite all the stupid things that that son did, the father was still happy to see him. In fact, he was so happy, he did not wait for his son to come to him. He actually ran to his son and actually hugged him and kissed him and was so happy to see him that he just couldn't let him go. And that's the way our God is. When God sees us coming, he doesn't wait for us to come all the way to him. He comes right to us. And he embraces us. And he kisses us. Because he is so happy that we have come back to him. In Romans chapter 9, verse 22, <clears throat> it says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Just think about that. Because let's just be honest, according to what the Bible says, we all deserve wrath and destruction from God. And God could have very well said, you know what, I'm tired of you, I'm going to take care of you right now. God could have very well said, you're all gone. And when he says that, that could have very well wiped us off of the earth. But God didn't do that. Because he loves each and every one of us. And he wants to give us the opportunity 
to come back to him. Peter gives the reason why God is showing patience and grace and compassion toward us. It is because God does not desire for anyone to perish without him. Instead, he wants us to repent and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation. God, again, God doesn't want us to be eternally separated from him. But God is also not going to make us choose him either. He's going to leave that decision up to us. God is going to give us the choice on whether or not to accept Jesus Christ's gift of salvation. If we choose to reject it, then we'll spend eternity away from God in the lake of fire. If we choose to accept it, then we'll spend eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ there in heaven. And that is what God desires the most. He wants us to be in heaven with him for eternity. In fact, listen to these other scripture passages that illustrate this, because you hear some people say that our God is a judgmental God, and, and yes, it is God's nature. He has to deal with sin. But before he does that, he, again, he wants to give us the opportunity for us to come to him. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, you're going to hear one word that is common in this verse, and it's the word come. It says, come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. God wants us to come to him. He not, does not want to turn us away. You may be thinking right now, well, well, Jeffrey, you don't know what I've done in the past. No, I don't know what you've done in the past. But I do know this. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. God still wants you to come to him. And he will not turn you away if you come to him in repentance and faith. Jeremiah 13, 17, it says, But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears, because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. It does not pleasure God for people, the Jews, to reject Jesus Christ. It does not pleasure God to send people to hell because they choose to go there. And that's basically what it is. Some people say, well, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, it's not because God sends, it's because they chose to go there. Because again, God has to deal with sin. But believe me when I tell you this, when, e when either you die and have rejected Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or when that day comes, when you stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has to tell you, depart from me, you evildoer, for I do not know you. Believe me, he's going to be doing it with tears in his eyes. Because it is not his desire for you to be eternally separated from him. But again, he's not going to force you to choose him. Ezekiel 18, verse 32, again it says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God, so turn and live. It's God's desire for us to turn back to him and to put our faith and trust in him so that we can live not only physically in the spiritual realm but for eternity and to live here on this earth following the Lord Jesus Christ, but also for us to live eternally with him in heaven. We may think that we just have too much to give to Jesus Christ because we've done so many bad things. But Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What better rest is there than to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Matthew 23, verse 37, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and this again, this is Jesus talking. This is right before he goes in for his triumphal entry. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing 
You could see the pain that was in Jesus' heart and the tears that he was shedding when he was saying this because he wanted so bad to gather all the people there in Jerusalem to him, just like you would see a mother hen gather her chicks with her. But they were not willing. They rejected him. But we also have to understand this. When we do come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't come to him on our own terms. We have to come in repentance, which basically repentance means that it's a complete change of mind. It's, start, it's, doing, it's stop doing things your way, and you start doing things God's way. As Luke 13, 3 says, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Of course, we all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God loved the world so much that he sent his only Son to die on the cross for each and every one of us so that we could have a personal relationship with him. John 8, 24, it says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I'm just going to be frank and honest about it. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will die in your sins. And what that means is this, is that not only will you die physically, but it also means that one day you will stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment, and Jesus Christ will look in the books, and he will see all the sins that you've committed. And he will tell you, depart from me, for I never knew you. And then you will be put in the lake of fire, and you'll be there for eternity, separated from the Lord God. And it is not a pleasant place. Some people believe that hell is a place where people are annihilated. You will not be annihilated in hell. You will be there for eternity. And it will be a never-ending torture, never-ending darkness, and never-ending pain. Because you're eternally separated from God. But again, that's not God's desire for you. 1 Timothy 2, 3-4, it says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That knowledge is the gospel. But again, it's up to you on what you do with that. And again, in Revelation 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty, come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So the question I have for you, for those that don't know Jesus Christ, will you come to the Lord Jesus Christ today? You see, God desires for us to be saved. But that decision is up to you. Your parents, your grandparents, your children, ain't nobody in your family or your friends that can make that decision for you. Only you can make that decision for yourself. And for those of us that are saved, we must proclaim this same message to others who don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because as I mentioned earlier, we don't know when Jesus Christ will return. And when that day comes, it will be too late. You may say, well, well, Jeffrey, I just don't feel comfortable sharing my faith with others. So are, are we saying that if we have a family member or friend that we love so much that we're not willing to share the gospel because we get a little uncomfortable. And I'm not trying to condemn anybody in saying that because I'm going to be honest with you. That's something that I'm convicted of as well. I need to be more intentional in sharing the gospel with others. Probably, if most Christians are honest, probably we would all say that. But we must get, up, get past our comfort level and be able to, to share the gospel with others and share how Jesus has impacted our life. And yeah, it may feel weird. In fact, it probably will feel weird at first, especially if you're not used to doing it. 
But I promise you, when you do share your faith with someone, you'll never feel any better than what you than knowing that you tried to share your faith with that person. And don't think that it's your responsibility to save that person because I've got news for you. You can't save them. Only the Holy Spirit can. The only thing Jesus calls us to do is to share the gospel with them and give them that opportunity. Everything else is left up to the Holy Spirit. And as uncomfortable as it may be, just imagine if you decided not to take that opportunity to share the gospel and then you saw that loved one or that friend of yours laying in a casket either in a funeral home in a church and you have to deal with that guilt of I had the opportunity to share the gospel with him and I didn't do it. Now talk about an uncomfortable feeling. And that's something I definitely have struggled with. And I promise you, it is something you do not want to have on your heart and conscience. So may we as Christians be more intentional to share the gospel with those who don't know Jesus Christ. Let me share with you this last story to conclude. In the year 1967, there was this man named Charles Murray who was a student at the University of Cincinnati, and he was preparing for the Summer Olympics in high diving. And at this time, he was not a Christian. He did not go to church. He did not believe in anything dealing with the Bible or religion or anything like that. But one day, he met someone in a class that was a Christian, and he struck a friendship with this person, and his new friend ended up sharing with him that God loved him and wanted to have a relationship with him. And Charles Murray, to, to be quite honest, he was quite skeptical about it. But he was interested. So over the semester, he talked to this friend about God's love and how much he mattered to God. Well, one night, Charles Murray decided to call his friend up. And he told him over the phone, can you tell me those verses again that that say that God cares about me. And his friend shared those verses with him on the phone. Well, after he talks to his friend, he hangs up and he goes over to the indoor pool there at the University of Cincinnati. He actually had some special privileges to access that pool since he was preparing for the Summer Olympics. And he could go to the pool basically any time that he wanted, even if the pool was closed to the public. Now, obviously, when he got there to the pool, the pool was closed at that time. But the building that the pool was in had a glass ceiling. And the full moon was shining through that glass ceiling. So he could see where the diving board was. And also, since it was closed, obviously the lights weren't on. And he didn't turn the lights on as he thought he didn't need them since he was able to see where the diving board was. So he goes up the diving board, he goes to the end, and he's getting ready to do a dive backwards. And so he gets in his position and he stretches out his arms. And when he does that, with the full moon shining on him, he was able to see his shadow. And when he looks over at the wall, he sees his shadow, and when his arms are like this, obviously, it forms a cross. And it was there when Charles Murray finally realized that God loved him. He realized that Christ died for him. That is how much God loved him. And in that moment, on that 20 feet plus diving board, Charles Murray sat down at the end of that diving board and he opened his life to God. And he said this, he said, Jesus Christ, come into my life and make a difference in my life. And he became a follower right there, 20 feet up. Well, he was sitting there in the dark, contemplating his decision. And about five minutes later, 
a janitor walked in and suddenly flipped on the light switch. And it startled Charlie. Well, he got up and he looked back down on the pool. And he noticed that the pool had been emptied for repairs. You see, Charles Murray did not deserve heaven. He could have ignored that shadow of the cross there on the wall, and he could have jumped right into that pool and end up being killed and being eternally separated from God. But instead, he found grace. Likewise, there's not one single one of us that deserves heaven. I didn't deserve heaven. You don't deserve heaven. The fact that anyone that anyone can be saved is a miracle of grace. And God offers that opportunity. God is waiting for the right time. However, that will be decided. And then sin will be dealt with once and for all. But you see how God's timing works? You see, God not only used another person to reach out to Charles Murray, but God also, in his own timing, stopped Charles Murray from potentially getting killed and being eternally separated from him. That's how much the Lord Jesus Christ loves you. And so let me talk to those of you that don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I hope and pray that whenever you listen to this message, that you take the time right now to think about that major decision. And I want to walk you through how you can make that decision today. And I want to encourage you to make that decision today. Because you may not have another opportunity. Jesus Christ may return today. Or something could happen where you may not have another opportunity. We've had in our area here several people that I'm aware of that were relatively young ages, or one was at a young age. Or earlier that day, they were operating just as fine as you and me. But then because of accidents, either they were severely injured or even killed. Or something health-wise might happen to you. I mean, all kinds of things could happen to where you can't make that decision anymore. So I hope and pray that you take this seriously. And I hope and pray that you'll make that decision today. And if you have decided to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, let me walk you through how you can do that. First, you must repent of your sins. Because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, repent means to make a complete mind change. You stop doing things your way and you start doing things God's way. And you may say, well, Jeffrey, I'm a good person. I can earn my way into heaven. No, you can't. Because the Bible is clear. Even our own righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. You cannot earn your way into heaven. The only way that you can receive salvation is through Jesus Christ and through faith in him alone. So first you repent, which means you stop doing things your way and you start doing things God's way. You make that complete mind change. Second, you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and arose again the third day to conquer your sin and to conquer death. Because as Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's where sin gets us. And if we try to depend on our own righteous acts, guess what? We still deserve death. Because all it takes is just one sin. And we're condemned to death. But the second half of, of verse 23 gives us good news. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's like it says it's a gift. All you have to do is receive it. Romans 5, 8 says what that gift is. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. And three days later, he rose again to conquer sin and to conquer death. But you have to receive that gift. You can't earn it. If you earned it, it wouldn't be a gift. You have to receive that gift. So you repent of your sins. You believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and arose again the third day to conquer sin and to conquer death. And then third, you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Because as Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There is nowhere it says you might be saved. It does not say you could be saved. It says you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And again, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, because Romans 10, 13 says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone, or as the King James has it, whosoever includes you. And again, he says that you will be saved if you accept that gift. And I want to encourage you, if you have accepted that gift, what I want to encourage you to do is this, is to find a local church, a local Bible-believing church, and share that with their pastor. So that way, your other brothers and sisters in Christ can celebrate that with you. And after you share that decision, then go into the waters to be baptized and then continue to attend that church to continue to be trained to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And now let me talk to those of you that are saved. I want to encourage you to find one person this week that you know does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I want you to do two things concerning that person. First, I want you to pray for that person. And here's what I want you to pray about. First, pray that their hearts will be receptive to the gospel. And then second, pray to, that God will give you an opportunity to give you that time to share the gospel with them and even share your testimony. And then the other thing I want you to do is this is to actually find that person, sit down with them, and share your testimony and the gospel with them. And yeah, it may feel weird at first, but I promise you that's one of the best gifts that you can ever give your loved one, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because again, we don't know how much time that we have left. So I want to encourage you to take this time right now to get right with God and to lead others. To him. So I'm going to ask you to please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach your word. And Heavenly Father, I just pray for those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray that they have made that decision here this morning. And I just pray that they would not waste any more time making that decision. I pray that they would accept that gift of salvation from Jesus Christ because you have given us this time to make that decision. And I do pray for those that have already made that decision. I pray that they would realize that they have the best news that we can give other people, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that they would find that one person this week that they can share the gospel with. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will work on that person's heart that they share with. And I pray that they would make a decision on Jesus Christ as well. And I pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.